Today we are speaking to a brand new platinum miner with strong Chinese financial backing and a rich ore body. And we find out exactly what goes into starting up a new mine. I'm Nozi Pombanjwa. Welcome to Resource Watch. Here's a roundup of news making headlines in the resource sector. South Africa's government says it has not concluded a deal with Russia for the supply of eight nuclear reactors. The initial news was met by severe criticism over concerns about transparency, but the Energy Department says its nuclear build procurement process hasn't yet started. It's just signed an intergovernmental agreement with Russia and other potential partner countries. Coal exporter BHP Billiton and rail utility Transnet have signed a long-term agreement valued at 24 billion rands over 10 years. This will see Transnet move around 18 million tonnes of coal yearly to the privately owned Richards Bay Coal Terminal in KwaZulu-Natal. The European Investment Bank, IEB, will provide $29.3 million for investment in a solar power station project after signing a 20-year loan agreement with the Burkina Faso government. The solar power will be constructed at Zaktuli on the outskirts of the capital, Ouagadougou. This is where Platinum focuses on high-value PGM and strategic metals and has ambitions to grow into a sustainable mid-tier mining house. We're speaking to this is where Platinum's Chief Operating Officer, Paul Smith. Paul, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Now, this is where not very well known. Uh, maybe just give us a, a quick uh, historical overview of where we see where comes from and most importantly, where you're going. Well, we've had quite a, a long and slow history because we, we started off from greenfield exploration um, and uh, that certainly takes takes a long time. But I think with Seasware has catapulted itself into, into being a developing mine and a large mine at that uh, recently with, with the strategic investment from uh, Jing Shuang and the China Africa Development Fund, which is very fortunate for us. So, um, yeah, we certainly have uh, popped up and uh, in the process of developing a, a large mine, 420,000 ounces of PGMs produced per annum once we're up and running. Mm. Um, so very exciting future. We'll certainly get into the relationship that you have uh, with the Chinese and your production targets, but maybe let's have a quick reflection on your recent interim results. What do they tell us about the overall health of West Caesar Platinum? Right, I mean, uh, as a developing company and a, a developing a single project, um, obviously one doesn't focus on earnings mm. but rather on capital spent because it's, it's about spending the right capital uh, efficiently um, and, and quickly. So the results really just indicate uh, the, the, expending, the expenditure rate which is going very well and, uh, and the building of the balance sheet. So not too, not too exciting yeah. but uh, what it also reflects uh, is, is the funding available and the, the, uh, the applying of that fund to the project. One of the uh, key concerns uh, that came up uh, following those results, of course, and on the back of a, a, a platinum stri uh, strike that really almost crippled the economy, were big questions about the decision to build new mines as against uh, pick up uh, assets that are already available. Maybe talk us through the rationale behind that again. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't sound right. Mm. And, and a lot of people ask that question. Um, but mining is very cyclical um, uh, and it always will be, that's the first point. And the second point is successful mines are always based on good ore bodies, mm. uh, in other words what's in the ground. Um, so if one looks at more mature operations that may be for sale, one has to take a very careful look at the ore body itself. Now what we have is a virgin ore body uh, which is uh, of the best values that you will find in the bushfell complex and that's the driving force for building a new mine as opposed to for example taking that capital and uh, and looking at buying uh, other mines that may be for sale um, so because the resources do deplete. Yeah. Does this uh, also automatically mean that you have no appetite for some of the platinum assets uh, that the likes of example of Neil Foneman have been quoted as saying that they've got their eyes on? No, look, I mean, we, we, we certainly do look at those assets and, and are looking at those assets. Um, but uh, but it, it, like everything, it's all about price and value. 
uh, and what is strategically good for mm. the development and sustainability of a successful mining company. So absolutely, we'll look. But uh, no, I don't think we'll be rushing in yeah. uh, at anything just yet. You've had first-hand experience uh, in terms of bringing in the community as you start off a new mine. What are the, the key takeaways that you might be able to share with us from that? Well, with the Bakabung, and, you know, we, we are very fortunate, I think, to be working with the Bakabung. And the relationship uh, has grown from strength to strength. It did have a wobbly start, mm. but I think both sides have worked very hard uh, to, to develop a sound relationship. And I think that sound base is now be beginning to deliver fruit in terms of the, uh, 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 employment, in terms of housing, infrastructure. There really is a lot of exciting things happening right now, which we're very proud of. Mm. Uh, Would you then say that uh, all issues relating to some of those initial hurdles with the community and the leadership have since been resolved? Not, not entirely. In there, there is certainly a bit of a hangover in terms of those issues because like in any community, you get different, uh, different positions mm. by different groups of a community. So, so one, you know, I think they're largely resolved um, and we are, we are basically cleaning up and, and yeah. agreeing the way forward. So uh, it, overall, yeah, very positive and I think a very bright future going mm. forward. Your, your exact geographical positioning is also one that raises a couple of questions, being right next door to the Pilansburg. Um, how have you had to deal with some of the environmental concerns that come with being in that position? Yes, I think the, the, when, when we made application for the mining rights a number of years ago, there was a very detailed environmental process that one had to go through. We went through that. Uh, we ticked all those boxes. We mm. had tremendous communication with, with all the stakeholders around us. Uh, and, um, and yeah, we resolved, I think, most, if not all, of the issues. So yes, we are very close to the Pilansburg and Sun, you know, Sun City itself. Mm. But um, you know, to date, we're very fortunate that we, 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 we agreed on the way forward. And also, we must also understand that mining is a, a very much part of the community, yeah. as is Sun City being part of the community. So it is a diversification for the localized community, and that's critical for sustainability. Let's talk about the Chinese involvement. Uh, many, of, of course, have uh, raised eyebrows again at uh, your, your close relationship uh, to the Chinese, and especially your reliance on the funding from that uh, aspect. How are you navigating, one, the external perceptions, but also a new relationship, given that uh, the Chinese traditionally haven't been known to dabble in the platinum space in South Africa or in Africa broadly? Yeah, that's right. I, I think the, 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 the initiative uh, led by Jing Shuang, ultimately, and China Africa Development Fund uh, is part of a broader strategy within, within the emerging markets, Southern Africa, South America. Um, so that's point one. Point two, I think uh, the investments made are focused on the long term, you know, in terms of sourcing key metals. And yes, it's, it is really the first delve into platinum. But we must also remember that Jingshuang itself, as a primary nickel producer in China, mm. does produce PGMs as a byproduct. So uh, is very familiar with the metals. But the importance of platinum and palladium are very important in, in terms of strategic metals going forward. And so yes, uh, being such a powerful economy, uh, uh, you know, China would want to be in platinum and has made that decision. Beyond uh, Bakopong, what are your future expansion plans and where are we likely to see where seas we're playing? Well, it's going to be a long story. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, there's not much I can say on that, that point just yet. Um, but uh, as I said, we continue to look at everything. Uh, both within the borders of South Africa and external as well, because obviously Zimbabwe is becoming a, a, a very important player mm. in, the, in the platinum business. Mm. And overall, it's, uh, this, the state of uh, the attractiveness of South Africa as an investment destination, given uh, the, the, the policy uncertainty that we're said to have right now, where do you position us? Yeah, look, I, I think we've all learned a lot uh, over the last couple of years in terms of, of the, the mine owners, government, labor, 
of the sensitivity and, and of, of our industry. And it's not as robust as we think. It is very sensitive to, to input pressures like costs and capital and work efficiencies. So I think we've all kind of learnt from, from the last year or so um, that, that we've got to pull together, and we are, to, to really sustain this business because mm. it's critical to this country in terms of, of uh, revenue uh, growth. And very quickly, before I let you go, Paul, when can we expect uh, the first production to come from underground? Well, latter part of 2017, we see the first ore out of the shafts and then the, the first production out of, in terms of metals in mm. concentrate is the latter part of 2019. But there's a very large uh, build-up time because given the size of the operation. Paul, thank you so much for making the time to join us. That was uh, Wesiswa Platinum's Chief Operating Officer, Paul Smith. Now, glass blowing is a glass forming technique that involves inflating molten glass into a bubble with the aid of a blowpipe. From this, all laboratory requirements are catered for, ranging from small test tubes, beakers, as well as flasks. We visited Glass Blowing Industries, a company with over 60 years in the industry. Glass is made by melting together several minerals at very high temperatures. Silica, in the form of sand, is the main ingredient. Combined with soda ash and limestone, this is melted in a furnace at a temperature of 1,700 degrees Celsius. Glass Blowing Industries was founded in 1952 by Tony Haltman and Carl Herb. 62 years later, the business is synonymous with high quality and superb craftsmanship of pharmaceutical containers such as test tubes, beakers and flasks. Glass Blowing Industries has worked closely with scientists and technicians in research and development laboratories throughout the country for companies like Impala Platinum, Anglo-American and Sassel. We supply them quite a lot, I would say, yeah. And honestly, um, I think we also play a big role in that, you know, because it's also part of uh, like job creation and with our products not there, they are unable to carry on. Uh, for instance, um, Impala Platinum, we make Pyrex ampules for them. There's two lots or two types that we supply them, which they run um, tests in the mines and they have to use the special kind of glass that we use, which is Pyrex. Providing essential tools for the technical expertise needed in the resources sector. And that's it for this week's Resource Watch. Do stay in touch following me at Nozi Pombandra or at CNBC Africa. And don't forget our hashtag, that's Resource Watch. From myself and the team, it's goodbye. <laughs>